you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I wonder if we can lift up our hands in this place. Oh, we need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. I've lived stories that have proved your faithfulness. I've seen miracles my mind can't comprehend And there is beauty in what I can't understand Oh Jesus, it's you Oh Jesus, it's you Sing, I believe, I believe The wonder working God The wonder working Too good to not believe You're the wonder-working God But you heal because you love All the miracles are too good Too good to not believe You're too good to not You're too good to not believe Sing, I can't, I can't rest Just the mention of your name can raise the dead. Sing all the glory, all the glory to the only one who can. Oh, Jesus, it's you.
sometimes the narrative when you're sitting there and you're in the middle of your mess you're in the middle of a need for a miracle and so often we can sit there and we can look at whether it's a worship team it's your pastor someone who's speaking into your life say but you don't understand where I've been you have no idea where I am and as we begin to sing this song and we went through it as I looked on this platform I can tell you this morning you want to talk about miracles that we've witnessed cancer disappear broken marriages restored relationships birthed out of pain I can look up here and I can see miracle after miracle after miracle. We're not singing a song that somebody else wrote that we're trying to figure out. We're singing a song that we can understand and there is credibility behind and saying, Hey, I know what it's like to have to go through my own personal nightmares. I know what it's like to have mental health issues. We know what it's like to have broken marriages. We know what it's like, but I'm here to tell you this morning that there is faith and peace in this room. And if you need a miracle for the next few moments, we're going to pray right now. And I want you to believe that God is hearing you, that these songs are more than just words. These are affirmations of things that have happened before. So let's pray right now for the needs in this room, what you are facing, and the needs behind me on this board. Lord, I am grateful that I can come into this room, that I don't have to keep a mask on, that I don't have to pretend that I'm not broken, that I don't have to pretend that I don't have any needs, but I can come into a room with folks that know what it's like to come in here. I might have dragged myself in this room, but I am so glad that I've met you once more, that you are here hearing our prayer. You have heard the sacrifice of these lips as we begin to worship and praise you in the middle of our nightmares, in the middle of the, of the season that we're in. But God, I know that you are alive and well and that you are listening to us right now. Then God, that you are orchestrating the miracles, that you are dispatching angels, that you are working in our tomorrow. Because Lord, if you were the same yesterday, you are the same one that forgave me then. You're the same one that loved me then. You're the same one that provided then. If you're doing that today, then I know with confidence you're working in my tomorrows. And so Lord, we are so grateful that we can come in here and know that I might not have the strength I might not have all the answers, but I am sure glad I can come in here and hear from you and touch heaven with my words. Touch heaven with my faith. And we believe that in Jesus' name. All across this room, let's clap our hands and thank him one more time. Aren't you thankful? That although we're in a new year, you just don't reset everything. I am so thankful I'm in a new year with the same God that was there last year, that got me into this year, that'll get me into next year. The same God I was worshiping is the same God today. And I am grateful that there is an atmosphere of victory in this room, that you do not have to leave the same the same way you came in this morning, we can walk out of here changed, recharged, victorious, knowing he loves you, has kept you and provided for you. Thank you, Jesus, for this morning. Thank you so much for coming. As you make your way back to your seats, to every guest that is in this room on behalf of First Church, we would like to thank you. First Church, why don't you put your hands together for every guest that is in this room. Thank you so much for making today special. When you walked through those doors on your left is uh actually to the center now as we're in life group semester we've uh, kind of changed the front there and and we are uh, uh we have some connect cards out there so if you're a guest here and you would like to connect with us something we can pray about help you uh, some basic information we would like to receive from you and that's on that connect card so if you can fill that out after service and you can drop it off right there in that box and someone from our team will reach out to you and for those of you online Thank you so much for making today special also and joining us. And we trust that what we feel in this room, you are feeling right where you are. And again, if you would get on our First Church uh, website, then you can fill out the online connect card and someone will reach out to you from our team. Uh, but this is the, 
best way you can start the week is by being in community with one another and worshiping the Almighty God and, and hearing what God has for us. Uh, but just allow me a few moments to paint a picture of what this week looks like here for His church. Uh, tomorrow night is prayer, 7 o'clock. Uh, we have a core value that uh, prayer is our anchor. And we believe that everything we try to do here at First Church, not just corporately, but individually, is based on prayer. So if, you, if it's at all possible, if you could be with us tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, I promise you, you will not regret time in prayer together. This Wednesday night, we will not be having Bible study. We have launched our winter semester of life groups. And so uh, there's some great groups out there that are still open. So if you can, please make your way out. Uh, to the lobby after service and fill out which life group would fit the rhythm uh, that you are in right now. And if you're online and you would love to join a life group, you can do that. First, churchsterlingheights.com. Click the link of life groups and you can sign one up right there and one of the leaders will reach out to you. Uh, and if you're here again as a guest and you'd like to know, hey, how can I plug in? What are life groups about? What, what, does, what does prayer look like? Then Growth Track is your next step and that takes place the third and fourth Sunday of every month. And so I would encourage you to be here. It's during service. Someone will prompt you to go into that class right outside of these doors, through the glass doors, and one of our team members will sit with you and you can go through Growth Track, figure out what your gifting is and how you can plug into this city, into this community, to our church. Everyone is important, and so we want you to just join in. And if you've been a part of First Church for any length of time, then you will know that we are in our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And it's going really, really well. And I encourage you, if you have not done so, uh, there are several ways you can fast. Typically, you hear about a Jewish fast, sun up to sundown, or it's the Daniel fast. No, no dairy product, no meats or sweets, any of that. Again, more information on our website. But if you have never fasted before, that's okay. Just take something out of your day and pray during that time. And I promise you, you're going to see a difference individually and we'll feel it corporately. So we encourage you to join us on our 21 days of prayer and fasting. This will be a pivotal year for First Church, and it's going to take all of us together consecrated to see something incredible happen here that's going to affect our community. In just a few moments, we're going to uh, return our tithes and offerings. But before we do that, I would like to set the expectation for today. In just a few moments, Pastor will come up, and he is delivering the second part of the Heart Attack series incredible series that he has started uh, it's already changing lives and i believe what you hear today is going to impact you and it's going to be something you'll take home and be able to apply it and following that pastor will have us come up and we're going to pray together and that's a time where we can just seek god and try to take some of those principles he's sharing and apply it it's something that'll change you when you walk out of these doors but here at first church another core value that we have is that we live modestly to give radically and i want to share some really great news with you i was on the uh on an email chain with uh, Reverend Daniel Borges from Brazil. Many of you, if you remember several years back, about eight men of our church, we went to Brazil to help build a building, a church house for them. They've outgrown that. Uh, several thousand over the last several years have been filled with the Holy Ghost, have been baptized in Jesus' name as a result of men coming from this church and going to Brazil that you uh, sponsored and sent. And now our students, Next Gen, will be going to Brazil and they're going to be doing a children's revival there uh, and so the cool thing is they're going to be worshiping in the same building that our men put together. Very special. Uh, but last week we committed as a church group $10,000 to help them build or actually purchase another piece of property for them to expand because revival is hitting Brazil. And you are a part of their journey. You are a part of their story. People all over the world are experiencing Jesus Christ because of the vision that is carried in this house. And that's to serve our world. And that happens right through our finances here. And I'm grateful for, for a church that can see further than just Sterling Heights or our local community. We're going to pray. And then after that, you're going to see a three-minute timer. We're uh, up there. You'll see a graphic how you can return your tithes and offering. You can do that in person or online. If you're a guest, we're not asking anything extra from you. But if you do feel to partner with us, pray about it. And whatever God is telling you, that's what you act on. Lord, I am grateful to be in a room where we can feel your presence above all things. And I'm grateful to be in a room to give into a principle of tithing and offering. Because we just sang the miracles that we have seen. I have watched with my own eyes souls all across this world receive your spirit and to take their next step because of a church that was concerned with the bigger picture, not just what happens here in these four walls. 
And so, Lord, as we continue this discipline, I believe that once again, there is going to be a harvest of souls that will come to know who you are because somebody was willing to give a little bit extra and to partner with the kingdom that you have, have enabled us to be a part of. And so, God, touch us as we just not return this principle, but, God, the faith that is in this room that would be attached to that dollar amount and that as we hear the reports come back, we'll know that First Church in Sterling Heights, Michigan made a difference globally because we trusted you with what you have given us. And so, Lord, as we move on in this service, that every heart would be softened and open. Every ear would be able to hear what you're going to say in this message this morning. That, God, it's, mere than, it's more than just mere words, something that will check a box, but that we rehearse in our minds as we go home and, and we wake up in the morning and we think about these principles we're learning about our heart. Because, God, we can't afford to go into 2022 with the same heart issues that we faced and we dealt with in 2021. But, God, that we are progressing in the kingdom and that something powerful will happen when we apply these principles. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're glad you're here. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, it's been a wonderful week, and there's been a lot of great things that have happened, and we thank God for all of that. And uh, so we, we welcome all of you and all of you that are watching us from all over the planet. Gee, I was in Oklahoma this week and met so many people down there that faithfully watch this thing and uh, I got a text from someone in where were they I think they were in Mississippi and they said just came to my boy's house I had to get a fix and he had he was in the 
his boy had this big screen television and it was our service that was on that screen. It was whatever. We were blessed, Renee and I, to reconnect with this wonderful lady this week by the name of Christine. Christine, we want you to know that uh, we love you and, uh, and are so proud of you. With, uh, she's raised two boys and done such a great job. And her first son just uh, uh, is in his first year at, at the University in Ann Arbor. And so congratulations, sweetheart. And uh, we met her years ago, and she was always so kind to us. And then the restaurant that went out of business, and we lost track of her. I think it was Ashley. Where you at, Ashley? She's here somewhere. You were the one that found her, didn't you? So uh, we love you and uh, pray nothing but the richest blessings of God on you. Another precious lady. Uh, her name is Gigi, but I call her Boots because uh, most of the time when I see her, she's got a pair of cowboy boots on. And uh, she is such a cheerful woman, been so kind to us. And she watches this thing. So I, uh, I told you I would say something about you. So uh, I want to keep my word. God bless every one of you. And uh, last week, I introduced four monsters that uh, I am convinced poison relationships and, and destroy character and a lot of people's lives. And here they are once again. They are guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. Each, each of these four monsters are fueled by a debt debtor relationship. This is the very difficult dynamic that these four monsters create. And um, I, I, last week I gave you the example of money. If, if you owe somebody money and have not paid them back, whenever you're in the room with that person, there's a third person in the room with you. It is that debt that you owe. And somebody's always got the upper hand in the relationship. It isn't always the person that the money is owed to. Sometimes people won't pay you back and they're in control. And so either way, um, someone, someone has the upper hand. There's always an imbalance. And as I'm trying to show you in these times, there are only two ways to deal with this problem of guilt and anger and greed and jealousy. And as I'll show you, there's always a debt-debtor relationship. There's only two ways to deal with them. Either you pay the debt or you forgive the debt. That's it. As long as the debt remains unpaid or unforgiven, that debt is going to govern that relationship that you have. It filters everything. And so today I'm going to take a close look at, at these four enemies of our heart because as I tried to show you, in the Bible there are two hearts. You've got your natural heart and then there's that other thing that says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or when you've got your heart broken because of a whatever, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or, or whatever. Every wrong that we ever commit with someone is in effect uh, an act of thievery. We've, we've stolen something. If I steal something from you, I owe you. And so someone that's full of guilt knows that. And it is common for someone to say, I owe her an apology. I owe him an apology. Why, why do we say we owe them? I'll tell you why. Because your heart is telling you something. And the only way to make it right is either you pay it or they forgive it. And uh, even, even if the only currency is words, um, we feel obligated to pay. Um, I, I have followed uh, with interest, this this thing about this man Jeffrey Epstein, Epstein, 
apparently was worth billions of dollars, had houses in Paris and New York City and uh, Miami, New Mexico, owned an island in the Caribbean, had a fleet of jets, very, very, they don't know where his money came from, but he obviously was a wealthy man. And uh, he latched on to a British socialite by the name of Ghislaine Maxwell. And she was convicted. Um, Epstein, of course, committed suicide, possibly, in jail. Uh, he's gone. Uh, now, uh, Ghislaine Maxwell has been convicted and will be sentenced soon. Um, what they're worried about is will she talk? Because there have been former presidents that were involved with this, uh, high-profile lawyers, wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people, even went so far as to go into uh, the palace in England. There are millions, hundreds of millions of dollars at stake here, reparations to these women that were obviously taken advantage of. I heard one of them, or I read where one of them said last week, all I ever wanted was an apology. All I ever wanted was for someone to admit what they had done and say, I'm sorry. And if they would have, I would have walked away. But because they were unwilling to admit or to apologize, I'm going after their money. That's an angry person an angry woman in this case, or women in this. And I've seen people try to work it off, serve it off, pray it off. Um, no, no amount of good deeds, no amount of giving. I don't care how many Sundays in church you attend. It is a debt. It either has to be paid or it has to be canceled. Because guilt says, if you're guilty, you feel like I owe this person. But that's not what anger says. Anger has a debt-debtor relationship, but it's different. Guilt says, I owe you. Anger says, yes, you do. You sure do owe me. You think about that for a moment, because every time we get angry, it's almost always the result of not getting something that, uh, that we wanted, uh, something that uh, you feel that you deserved. Translation, somebody owed me. You show me an angry person and I will show you a hurt person. Someone owes them. If nothing more than an apology. I was on an airplane yesterday and the stewardess said, Mr. Hoppin, would you like a bottle of water? Yes, I would. So I pull my mask down to drink my water and this woman beside of me, she said, put your mask back on. And I said, no, nah, I'm not going to. <laughs> she lost it. And she said, I said, put your mask on. I said, no. <clears throat> she called the waitress or the stewardess. She wanted me thrown off of the plane. <clears throat> of which the stewardess, thank God bless her, said, I just gave that bottle to Mr. Hoffman. I'm sure when he's done, he'll put his mask back on, won't you? Maybe, you know. <clears throat> yes, yes, I will. But I drank that water really slow. <laughs> it drove that woman out of her mind. Finally, I got done and I put my mask back on. A little while later in the flight, she ordered a bottle of or, you know, wine. And I'm wondering, I want to know how you're going to get that in your mouth. You're going to pour it all over that mask and it's going to seep through the mask into your mouth? I don't think so. So I'm watching her and she knows I'm watching her. And she goes, she'd pull up her mask. Just, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I was sitting beside an angry person who had been hurt somewhere, but she was directing that anger at me and I had no idea why she was so angry. It wasn't the mask. She was just mad. And, and angry people, they don't reserve their anger for just one person. They're usually mad at just about everybody. And uh, 
Have, have you ever had an encounter with an angry person and they blow up you and you ask like I did yet, what in the world did I do to make you mad? What, what, what caused you to turn that, that vitriolic hatred on me? It, the answer is simple. I, you don't let them have their way. They didn't get what they felt like they deserved. And when you deal with extremely angry people, nothing you do will please them. If I would have put my mask on right then, she would have still been mad the whole flight. They have already decided you can't get it right. Even before you start, because they can't let you get it right. Because if you get it right, it takes away their excuse to be angry. And, 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 and if this isn't for you, well, then just let it go. But let me give you a test. Um, find somebody that, that you believe loves you and ask them if you have an anger problem. And then listen. Listen while they're talking to you. And um, it's called monitoring. We're talking about our heart here. They monitor hearts in hospitals. Let's monitor our, our inner man or inner woman here. It's just, um, it's just uh, if people pause before they answer or don't want to answer, um, uh, that ought to tell you something. If you feel compelled to interrupt them while they're talking uh, and explain, uh, that ought to tell you something. If you find yourself wanting to run away while they're talking, that ought to tell you something. That's good. That's, that's stirring up that sludge that's in the bottom of our soul. And like the word says, it's a mirror and you see what manner of person you really are. Don't get discouraged. You've just discovered something. And uh, it can heal you if you listen because anger gains its strength from staying secret. If, if you discover you have anger in your heart, let me give you a revelation. It will not come as a surprise to the people that really know you. <laughs> you see, the only one getting duped here is the angry person. Everyone else knows they have an anger problem. They've known it for a long time. But I believe these monsters are like roaches. I believe that they hate being exposed. They hate light shining on them. And that's what we're trying to do right here, right now. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? But he that hath clean hands and a pure heart. I, 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 you, 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 there's, a, there's a group of psalms from, I think, 120 to 134. They're called, at the beginning, they're called psalms of ascent. Uh, uh, what does that mean? These are psalms that were read or quoted and sung as people went up to Jerusalem, going up to Jerusalem. And you get to the end and it said, how good that, 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 that uh, and pleasant are people that dwell together in unity. It's like oil, holy anointing oil that ran down the beard of Aaron and then on the garment and then on the skirts. And it said, just as sure as you can plan on dew being the top of Mount Hermon every day, you can plan on God's blessing being on that situation. And, and, and it's a powerful thing because what it's saying is it's not just my job to, 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 to pray and study and have a right heart when I'm speaking to you. It's your job. As, there's nothing more powerful uh, than, 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 than anointing and the anointing comes from unity. And so when a house is united, there is a special anointing that comes on the speaker. Just as sure as dew is on Mount Hermon, there'll be anointing on the priest if he's speaking to a unified, a unified house. And, and, and I, 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 I just think it's very pertinent at this time, at the beginning of the year, let's start it off just looking at our, how's your heart? How's your heart? And, and maybe you're the person that needs to talk about it. Maybe on the other hand, you're the, you're the person that talks about it all the time. Uh, after all, any, anyone who was raised the way you were or faced the hardships that you faced or or were abandoned like you were, you have every reason, no, you have every right to be the way you are. Here's my challenge to you. Do you want to stay the way you are? Or do you want to change? Amen. How long are you going to allow people that you don't even like, many of them are no longer in your life, some of them are even dead, 
to keep controlling your life with the anger that you have towards them. I, I, I remember a, a woman, uh, I used to say between the North Pole and South Pole. Well, it was here. It was in this church. She's gone, but I, I, a woman who got so angry because another woman in this church came in and found a wonderful husband in this church. And the other woman was so mad and jealous. How come, how come I can't get a good man like her? It was obvious why. Because no man wanted to be around you. You were just mad. And, 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 and the jealousy the woman was feeling toward another lady was, had nothing to do uh, with that. Per- it was something in her past, that anger was there. Somebody didn't need well. And I... The Bible said in Mark chapter 10, there was a guy, he said, casting away his garment, he came to Jesus. That garment was his identity. That, 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 that was his lot in life. But before he even came to Jesus, he said, I, will, I refuse to continue to be the man I've always been. Uh, gee, I, I've, there's a guy known as the demoniac of Gadara. He's in the Bible five, three times, Matthew 8, Mark 5, Luke 8. Interestingly enough, Matthew 8 said there were two, two that met him in the tombs. Uh, Mark and Luke just talk about the one that was delivered. But uh, he goes to this man, he said, what's your name? Now, most Pentecostal preachers have interpreted that, that when you meet a demon-possessed person, you're supposed to get that, make that demon identify himself because that's what Jesus did. I don't believe that. I think Jesus was just talking to the guy. What's your name? But before he can tell him his name, his problem hijacks the conversation, said, our name's Legion. This is our turf. We are many. We are many. (laughs) It's a wonderful, um, boy, I gotta be careful. I don't start chasing rabbits right now. But there's a great scripture uh, that says, out of the womb of a woman are the issues of life. In other words, if you're gonna be on the planet, you need to come through the womb of a woman. So, Watch what these devils, they say, Jesus of Nazareth, have, have you come to torment us before our time? There's a great, they obviously know they're, they, the Bible said they lost their first estate and there are reserved chains for them. They know that. But what amazes me is if you read between the lines, they know who Jesus is. He's God in flesh. God is spirit. A spirit hath not flesh and bone. No man has seen God at any time. But when they say Jesus in flesh, God, deity wrapped in dust, they know who he is. Let me read between the lines with you. They're saying, where'd you get the body? We've only known you in spirit. Where'd you get the body? And he said, oh, I'm here legal. I came through the womb of a woman. Where did you get yours? Oh, that's not yours. You're, you're, you're here illegal. Well, then we're going to expel you. And he did. He evicted that spirit from that body. Why? It didn't come through the womb of a woman. It wasn't here legally. And, and, and there are so many times in pastoring I've met people and just, it tries, at the beginning of the conversation, uh, I just got out of prison. Um, I, I, I've just come through a divorce or I just declared bankruptcy. I'm not minimizing their past, but aren't you tired of allowing your past to be your present identity? Your name is not divorce. Your name is not bankruptcy. Your name is not felon. What's your name? Jesus is trying to establish a real relationship with you and I. But so many times our problems hijack the conversation. And we just let it happen. Resist the devil. And he'll flee. Don't Don't just lay down and let him kick you to death. (laughs) <laughs> it's just your story might explain your behavior but it doesn't excuse it 
It doesn't excuse it. Your story was never meant to be your excuse. It was meant to be your testimony. God is trying to use you as a billboard and a marquee to say to the rest of the world, I'm not saying what you didn't go through was bad, but I went through the same thing and I beat it. And if I beat it, you can beat it. And you don't have to be a hostage or a victim all your life. I, I, I basically put people in three categories. Number one, there's the victim. You know, always feeling like, you know, whatever. When my ship comes in, and it, when it comes in, it's gonna be a leaky canoe. You know, it's just, I just, always a victim. And then there's the other people who overanalyze. They, they go to every seminar, they read every book, and they never do feel ready. And then there's the third category of people who know that they're probably not prepared, but they just begin and learn as they go. It's just, for goodness sakes, quit being a victim and quit overanalyzing the thing. Let's go. Let's serve God. Let's just jump in this thing up to our neck and say, I, I, no, I don't know all the scriptures. I don't know all the verses. I don't, know, I don't know a lot about prayer. I don't know a lot of stained glass stuff. I don't even really know what an apostolic is, but I, I, would, like, I would like to live a different way of life. As you say, a higher way of living. If there wasn't a heaven, if there wasn't a hell, this is a better way to live. It's a better way to live. I have a great friend right now who just had a heart transplant, a heart, not a heart transplant. And they asked them all of these very personal questions about, you know, his, 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 his past. You know, have you ever been addicted to alcohol? Uh, what about drugs? What about nicotine? What, what about your, your personal, your, 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 your intimate life? You know, how many partners have you had? And, 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 and he just said, I, you know, I've, I've, I've been married to my wife and they, they almost smirked when he said it, but it was cute because when they came in a, a little while later and he asked them, how'd that do on the test? And one of them said, you have zero negatives. And he said, what does that mean? They said, you're one of the only patients we've ever had that didn't lie to us. We had the slides, we had the biopsies, we had the tissue samples. We knew if you had a drug past, we knew if you had STDs, we, we, we knew all that, but you were honest with us and we're gonna get you a heart. And they did last week. And he'll go home this week. He'll go home this week. <laughs> and he called me, he called me right before he went into surgery and he said, you've been my close friend. And he said, I, I wanted you to be the last person I talked to besides my wife before I, the anesthesiologist puts me under. But he said, I want you to remember what I'm saying, Harold. If I come out of this or not, he said, serving God is really paying off right now. Not just the spiritual aspect, just living a clean life made him a candidate for a new heart that would have gone off limits to him if he wouldn't have disciplined the way he was. You know, you can't have a testimony without passing the test. And, and I promise you that, that the people that you respect the most did not come from a perfect past. I promise you the people that you look up to and revere the most have an unsolid yesterday in their lives. And, and you may ask, how can someone that grew up in that kind of environment grow up so perfect? That's what happens when God does surgery on your heart. So, you know, angry people say, you owe me, you owe me, you know. Guilty people. The third beast, that's greed. And uh, because guilt says, you know, I owe you. Anger says, yes, you do. But greed says, I owe me. <coughs> the bottom line is that greedy people believe they deserve every good thing that comes into their life. They not only believe that, they, they believe they deserve every good thing that could possibly come into their life. In other words, what's mine is mine and I earned it and I got a lot more coming. And that's why it's hard to get greedy people to part with money or anything for that matter because it's theirs. And the truth is, they're just scared. 
they, they, they always have a story to tell. I remember being in the, in the home of a very, very well-known preacher and his wife. She was gone, but he was giving me a tour of what I believe was their, it was either their fourth or their fifth brand new house in the last six or seven years. Didn't matter what he built for her, she always wanted something else. It was a beautiful house, and we went to the end of what I thought would be the master bedroom, but it wasn't. It was a very large room with elaborate, expensive shelving and glass doors and it was baby dolls, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of baby dolls. And I mentioned a guy to you recently that I met in, named Frenchie Boudier. And Frenchie taught me about dolls. I never knew what a jumeau was until I met Frenchie. But a jumeau is a, is a, is a bisque face. It's a porcelain-faced doll. They're, they're, they're worth kajillions of money. And I hadn't knew enough about dolls to see things in that room. And I knew these weren't just something that you bought at Walmart. It, it was full of all kinds of very, many of them, very, very, very expensive. And he quickly told me, well, she was, she was raised so poor, she, she never could have a baby doll when she was a little girl. <clears throat> and that's why she's got 900 of them now. <clears throat> truth is she was greedy and everybody around her knew it she died recently um, I, I was raised in a small coal mine town in uh, country folk commonly referred to as hillbillies if you're a hillbilly you, we, we're proud of that, that we, we like that nickname hard working people they don't have much but invariably, in just about every little shack or house that was around me, that family usually had one item. One, there was usually one thing in that house that they really valued and displayed, and most of the time it was something from their past. This woman had a knack for going into those very modest homes of what many times were what we would call poor people. And she would find that one valuable item in that house. And she would not stop. Like a pit bull with a ham bone. She just wouldn't, oh boy, would I like to have that. And being the pastor's wife, most of them relented and gave her what she wanted. I was in that house when she was gone. There was stuff stacked everywhere. Stuff that people treasured. She wanted it. She got it, and she threw it. I remember being in a house one time, and back in the corner was a Cabbage Patch doll. I don't know if you are old enough to remember the Cabbage Patch doll craze that hit America. It was nuts. This is way before eBay. Buddy, they were going crazy trying to find a Cabbage Patch doll. And I was in this house, and there was one there just discarded in that room. <laughs> I remember the story of how that they did everything they could to please that greedy little kid they had. Greed is different than guilt and anger, and I'll tell you why. Because it's so good at masquerading. It's so good at disguising itself. Almost everyone in this room, I, I want to prove it to you how good Greed is at masquerading itself. Almost without exception, everyone that's in this room right now and you that are watching online, you have already said, well, at least that's one thing I don't have to worry about. I wonder what monster number four is. Because in your mind, most of you are already wondering. You've already skipped ahead. Not, not so fast. I mean, we all get upset every now and then. Uh, but now that I think about it, I have been in full-time ministry for 45 years. I have had pretty much everything confessed to me that you can imagine. Um, you name it. Uh, I've pretty much every 
horrible, terrible, titillating, juicy bit of gossip you could ever imagine. I've heard it, except one thing. In 45 years of full-time ministry, I have never, ever had anyone tell me, Pastor, I'm struggling with greed. I've never had anybody confess to me they're greedy. Now, their wife may tell me they're greedy. Or they, it hides. Greedy people mask themselves because they're good savers. And after all, saving's a good thing. Uh, they're, they're, good, they're good at planning. Now, that's a good thing. Go, I mean, doesn't that Bible say go to the ant sluggard? Uh, uh, um, we, we, we hide greed from ourselves. And just like anger, the people around us know. They know we're greedy. I'll give you a few of the signs to identify greedy people. Greedy people constantly talk about money. They are not cheerful givers. They'll give, but they're going to make sure you know they gave. Um, they're reluctant to share. They are horrible losers. I, I heard Oprah Winfrey interview Michael Jordan one time, and she said, uh, uh, we've got a friend of yours here, and all of a sudden, Charles Barkley comes. And Oprah being Oprah, she said, now, Charles, you've made it very plain to people that you think Michael Jordan is the cheapest man you've ever met in your life. And he said, Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods are the two cheapest men alive on the planet right now. And uh, she said, why do you say it? He said, they never tip, never. So she looked at Michael Jordan and said, is that true? You never tip? He said, no. He said, I don't ever tip, ever. I'll tell you why that is. Michael Jordan hates to lose. It's not about just being great at basketball. It's, they're constantly disputing with people over small amounts of money. They'll tell you, I've just got enough to get by. I'm dealing with a situation right now somewhere between the North Pole and the South Pole, and this individual is just making an absolute fool of themselves trying to convince people that they've been taken advantage of and they've been stolen from and they don't have anything and they're just barely scraping by and I know the other side of the story. They're very secretive. They don't want anybody knowing their business. We had a man come to this church several years ago. He, he owned, I believe at that time he had 600 rental properties. He was quite wealthy. He ended up having to move. I was sorry to see him go, but I sent him away with blessing. <clears throat> he came to me one time and he said, have you noticed anything different, Pastor? And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I don't know. Have, have you, has anything seemed just odd in your life the last little while? I said, I, I don't think so. He said, you know, I've never really told you who my family is. And he explained to me that his sister was one of the wealthiest women in the Midwest. And he said, my sister is vehemently angry at me because I'm coming to this church. So she hired the best private investigators in Chicago. And they've been following you for the last three months. Pastor, they, they, they have your W-2s. They... they they hacked your email accounts. They have interviewed your neighbors in Atlanta. They've interviewed your neighbors here. They have followed you 24 hours a day for the last three months. When I went to my sister's office, she had a file on you about that high. They told her, he's clean. She said, everybody's got a secret somewhere. And they said, not this guy. We have sifted through his life. Ask Valerie, she's got all my passwords. When Sister Hill was the financial secretary, she balanced my checking account. I don't have secrets. I heard, I told you, I, I read something that Mark Twain wrote a while ago, of course. He said, if you tell the truth, you don't ever have to remember. <laughs> because you know, 
I asked Sean Cabot, a wonderful attorney who used to go to this church. Now he's a great pastor. I, I wish I could tell you, I'm not allowed to, but I wish I could tell you how the church in Port Huron has flourished since Sean and Laura have become their pastors. It's no reflection on Dwayne or Carla or anybody else who's perceived it. It's just, he, he, it's, he's just, I'm so proud of him and what's happened. I asked him, I said, Sean, how in the world can you get somebody on the stand and ask them what they did 20 years ago? And he said, oh, you're gonna love this, Brother Hoffman. He said, that's how we catch the liars. He said, if you lie all the time, you have no idea what you said 20 years ago. But he said, if you're in the habit of constantly telling the truth, you know exactly what you said 20 years ago because it's the very same thing you would say today or yesterday or tomorrow. It doesn't matter. You just tell the truth so you don't have to go, I don't know what I, you know what you said. It's just the beauty of being honest. <laughs> it's just, listen, ladies and gentlemen, greed is not a money problem. It's a heart problem. It's a heart problem because money is never going to fix this monster. It comes from the heart, you know? <laughs> I'll tell you what it really comes down to. It's just, I'm, I'm terrified. I don't, I, don't think God, I don't think God can take care of me. I remember being in a music store years ago I wanted to get a copy of this song at this moment, it was called. <clears throat> so the guy behind the counter, I said, I, I wanna buy this song. I, I think Billy Joel sang this song um, at this moment. And he said, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Billy Joel guy. He said, Billy Joel didn't write that song. He said, sing it for me. And I said, no, no, man, I'm not gonna. He said, buddy, you can't believe the lousy voices I've had in this place. He said, there are people that really think they can sing and they can. He said, at least you're willing to admit you can't. But he said, give it a whirl, I'll figure it out. So dummy me, I start singing at this moment. All of a sudden in the back of the store, this guy said, it's Billy Vera and the Beaters. And the guy said, he's right. And I said, who in the world's Billy Vera and the Beaters? He said, he's what we call a one hit wonder. That's the only hit he ever had at this moment. I remember, I don't know if it's a one hit wonder or not. I remember a song, probably, I don't know, when the crunch was here, a guy named John Rich sang a song, they're shutting Detroit down. Ford's disappearing, Chrysler's gone, General Motors is, they're all belly up, they're all going bankrupt. The fear that grabbed this town. Boy, do I wish I would have bought Ford stock when it was 24 cents a share. Wow, guess what? It's still standing. We're still making cars, still selling trucks. They didn't tear Detroit down. But that fear that grabbed this is the same thing that gets a hold of greedy people. I, 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 the whole thing's gonna go down the toilet. I gotta hang on to everything I can. Good luck. Because the Bible talks about a man whose barn was full he was gonna tear it down and build a bigger barn because he was convinced that because he had a lot of stuff, he had a lot of time. And that night, with his fresh set of blueprints under his arm, the Lord said, thou fool, this night, your, your soul's required of you. You don't have a lot of time. The Bible says, don't think that your life consists in the abundance of things which you possess. Here's another translation. Take care, protect yourself against the least bit of greed. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. I've met greedy wealthy people and I've met greedy poor people. It's not a money issue, it's a heart issue. Because they think if I got a lot of stuff, boy, I got a lot of life. My stuff is not my life. My life does not consist of the things I possess. She was mess with their stuff, boy, and they feel thrilled. Why, their stuff is who they are. And uh, I remember being confronted with greed at, at an early age. I remember getting married to Renee. I was an only child, see? I, I, don't, I don't want nobody, nobody messing with my toys. They broke my stuff. I always kept my stuff. I kept the boxes, 
Man, if I had some of that stuff, do you know what a Johnny 7 gun is? Man, I had a Johnny 7 gun. I looked it on eBay. It's 1,200 bucks for a Johnny 7 gun. I still had the box. I can go on and on. I get married. I'm upset at Renee because she's going to see her sister or going to do this for the family, going to do that. And I was like, you don't, what, what are you, good? and I'll never forget the day my wife confronted me and said, I was not an only child, Harold. I had brothers and sisters. I'm sorry you didn't, but I did. And I love my brothers and sisters and I'm going to go see them whenever I want to, whether you like it or not. And she still does. She's going next week. I needed that confrontation. There's absolutely nothing wrong with what she was doing, but you're mine. Mm -mm. Not Renee. Not Renee. I remember one of the most selfless acts of forgiveness I ever encountered. I was speaking at a men's conference. There was thousands of men there. Thousands of them. And I was the guy, you know. And I knew it. It was, I'm not saying that, I'm saying that with confidence. I just knew I had the message for that night. And halfway through my message, the thing exploded. I mean, just, and I never did get it back. People just, it was just this upheaval, this avalanche of glory. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to do something. So they had a big American flag on that platform. I went over and I grabbed that American flag and I ripped it out of that stand and I started running back and forth across that platform. And when I did, men started taking off their suit coats and their ties and handkerchiefs and waving. It was a wave of offering in that. It was, it was glory, man, is what it was. And I don't know which lap it was, but there was a wonderful musician there by the name of Sonny Shambo. And Sonny Shambo was a very gifted musician singer and he had a, a Martin guitar. I believe they called it a D2. It was probably 70 years old. It was in excellent shape. He was so proud of it. I was running back and forth across that place. Somehow that big old flag I had wrapped around that guitar. And when I whipped that guitar like a slingshot, I saw that beautiful guitar, priceless guitar go, All the Holy Ghost was gone. I was absolutely mortified. I ran to that guitar, and of course, Sonny was right behind me. I looked at him so pitifully. He said, this is the greatest service I've ever been in in my life, Brother Hoffman. He said, don't worry about the guitar. If it's got a mark, I'll always look at that mark and remember this night because this is the greatest display of the glory of God I've ever been exposed to. <laughs> and in a moment, he just canceled the debt. And thank God that the guitar still was intact and still played, but it was scratched. And uh, I, I, I just, we're, greedy people are afraid God won't take care of them or God won't take care of them in the fashion they deserve to be taken care of. We are dealing with an entitled world right now. Yeah. I deserve this. Greed is supported with an endless list of what ifs. What if the economy collapses? Listen to me. Anger says, you owe me. Guilt says, I owe you. But greed says, I owe me. But jealousy says, God owes me. The list is endless. The things that other people have that you don't. Good looks, skill set, opportunities, the family they have. Hell, I always wanted to be six feet tall. I tell people I squatted to rise and I got cooked in the squat. They got the inheritance. I can go on and on. 
we think our problem is with that person. Our problem's with God. That when he gave your neighbor stuff that he could have given to you, but he didn't. You, you, you don't want their car. You want one like it. You, you, you find yourself staring at something, think, boy, they really look good. That, that's disgusting to me. You, 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 you may even tell them they look good, but inside you know, man, I hate you wearing that dress like that. If I just had what they had, if God only would have made you smarter, you would have... I, they told me for years I was a smart kid. I remember when Brittany was young. She was a Gerber baby. She, she just was. She, she looked like the, that baby on the outside of a Gerber jar. She had the ringlets. She had the eyes. She had that hair and that face and that skin. And she just, she was a very pretty baby. And all the time we would bring her to church, these people would say to her, you are beautiful. You're beautiful. And about four, right down there one night, I saw someone say, you're beautiful. And she said, I know. <laughs> I know, I know. They never ever said you're mannerly. They never ever said you're respectful. They never ever said anything about character qualities. She was more valuable because she was pretty. They told me for years I was smart. And after a while, yeah, I know, I'm smart. <clears throat> I was smarter than everybody else in McKinleyville grade school. Then I went to Bethany. I was smarter than all the rest of them. They put me in accelerated classes. Boy, that was just exactly what I needed, man. I was able to go at my own speed through the book. And so I went through the math book in two months and they gave me ninth grade math and 10th grade math. And I was really something. And then I went to a high school where it had accelerated classes and they put me in them. And I was in trouble because I knew I was out of my league and I was in class with really smart people that never studied, they just retained it. I had a friend named Pete, <clears throat> never studied, got a full ride to Harvard Law School. It was worth 250,000 bucks back then. I don't know what it's worth today, but then it was 250,000. Pete lasted three weeks, came back, got a job in the steel mill. I had a friend named Mark Schwartfager who had God just reach down and gave him a lightning bolt for an arm. And to this day, he's the only pitcher in high school foot or baseball in West Virginia that ever threw a no-hitter. He threw two of them in a row. He went straight to the Pittsburgh Pirates. They were going to take him right out of the farm team into what was called the show. They were going to put him in the big leagues. He lasted two months and came back because he, they could not break out of this bubble of their family to where everybody said, you're, you're the better pitcher than anybody else. Pete, you're smarter than everybody else. That when they got out of that comfort zone and realized that there's always somebody going to be skinnier, there's always somebody that's going to be smarter, there's always going to be somebody with more money than you, there's always going to be somebody more handsome or more attractive. That's just life. And if you're not careful, you're going to get this thing inside of you. What's going on here, God? How come you made me look like a fire plug? How come I don't have hair like that? What's the deal here? How come my dad didn't have a bunch of money? I still remember my daddy crying, Harold, I'm sorry. I, 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 I will not leave you in inheritance. And I said, Daddy, you left me a heritage of prayer. I, I'll take the heritage over, over the inheritance. But all of a sudden, my daddy dies and, 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 and AARP, the Association of Retired People, called me and said, we heard that your father passed away. Yes, he did. Do you know that your daddy had a life insurance policy with us? No, I didn't. Well, we're going to send you some money. And they sent us some money. And then headquarters for the UPC. My dad was a retired minister for the last, I think, 15 to 16 years. He didn't pay budget fees. They called me and said, do you understand that your father gets $10,000 as a budget fee? And I, and I, 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 or an interest or, or insurance policy. And I said, wait a minute, he didn't pay budget fees for the last 15 years. It doesn't matter. He already, it's already paid up. We'll send you 10,000 bucks. Bam, I get $10,000. I, 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 I go to Calcaterras to the funeral people and, and, and they're telling me, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, 
it's going to be close to 20,000 bucks. And then they said, um, was your dad in the military? I said, oh, yes, he was. And they said, would you, would you like to have him buried at Great Lakes? And that's what I always wanted. After Brother Sexton got buried there, it's like, wow. That's, and my dad saw it and said, that's where I want to be buried. And, 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 and then the guy just broke my heart. He said, do you have his discharge papers? And I said, what? what? Do you have his discharge papers? I said, are you kidding my dad had my my dad had Alzheimer's or sometimes whatever. It's just it's just I I I'll, I've been through most of his papers. No, I don't have his discharge papers. Well, we could probably get him there, but you're going to have to go to Chicago and you're going to have to go to the military records and maybe just maybe they can find his discharge papers. If not, you're going to have to wait six to eight months before you can bury your dad. And I'm thinking, oh, Harry would love that being in an ice box for eight months. You know, I said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And, and, and so I made the arrangements and picked out a casket and I go home and my mother, that, I mean, I go home and my mother's got this, this yellow bit of tissue paper and she said, Harold, I just found this in a drawer. What is this? And I looked at it, I said, that's 11,000 bucks. That's what that is. And I ran right back to the funeral home and the guy just grinned and he said, you just won the lotto, Harold. And it was all this money, over $10,000. All, all of a sudden, the place that he worked that went belly up years ago called me and said, no, 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 your dad worked for 30 years here. That money was put in a trust account. He gets, he gets life insurance and he sent it. And my daddy would get such a big kick out of knowing he wasn't as broke when he died as he thought he was. And I remember when we ran out of money building this church and my dad gave us money from what was called a Janus account. Janus went on to have 28% return year after year after year. My dad could have been worth cabillions, but he gave us 40,000 bucks. That was all the money in the world that he had. And he gave it to us so that we could finish. And never once did my dad ever say, give me my money back, not once. And whenever I tried to say, Daddy, I still owe you, he said, you don't owe me nothing. This church has been good to me. How great. He said, do you realize how many years we went to a difficult place and I always wanted to go to a good church with good people? He said, boy, you got a church full of great people. And he said, I've been so blessed with your mother to be here. And, I, and, and, and as a pastor, I'm telling you, I'm grateful for this church because you gave me the ability to be able to take care of my mom and my dad. But I think one of the reasons this church was blessed was because of the way my dad and mom have lived. Why? Because they weren't greedy. <laughs> it's just, I, I, I need to stop, but I, 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 until we... we we find a way to deal with this monster called jealousy. We're, we're going to find it impossible to obey that verse. Love one another. And that's why we're doing this at the beginning of the year. Because let me tell you about the surgeon of the ages. Amen. He's got the ability. He said, I will take out of you a heart of stone and I'll put in you a heart of flesh. The Bible said he can circumcise the heart. Circumcision is when you trim skin off so that an issue becomes very sensitive. This God that we serve can take away the callous and the bruise that life has imposed upon you and give you a, a to where you have a sensitive spirit. God can repair the bruised reed. God can coax the coal back into flame. He said, give me an ear or a piece of a tail and I'll put, the, I'll put the sheet back together again. All the king's horses and all the kings of men can put Humpty Dumpty back together, but Jesus can put Humpty Dumpty back together again because he said, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. All things have become new. Stand and thank him right now with me. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Why are you doing this, Pastor? Because this is the perfect time. This is the perfect time at this juncture, at this beginning of this year. You know, you feel guilty. You feel like you owe somebody. Well, for goodness sakes. Deal with it. Deal with it. Are you angry because someone owes you? How about, why don't you just forgive it and let it go? I, I, years ago as a pastor, I learned, we don't loan money in this church. We give money when we can. Because I learned a hard lesson years ago pastoring that when we loaned money to people, every time they were in the room with me, they felt guilty and said, Pastor, I'm, I'm going to give your money back. It's 
thought wasn't my money. It was the church. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. But so now, say, here. And if you can pay it back, fine. If you can't, fine. It's amazing how many people have paid it back. <laughs> Are you greedy? Are you greedy? <laughs> my amazing mother, who now has this small nest egg of life insurance money told me a week ago how much do should I give for the new building here <laughs> it's just the way we are I am going through my house and every box that I've had for years and in my mind I've collected books for years and I've got some really great books and all I can do right now is look at them books and say I wonder how much money I can get out of that book for the offering. Or I got this gun that someone gave me. I wonder how much I can sell that for to give to the offering. And I'm doing this in my mind. Come with me around the altar. You precious people that are watching us, I'd like you to pray with us if you would, where you are. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I was speaking in Oklahoma yesterday. I think it was yesterday. No, it was Friday. I think it was Friday. Yeah, it was Friday. And I, I was speaking to a group of ministers, and I said, I'm 64 years old. We're going into a building program. And I said, I need to go into a building program like I need polio. I should be feathering my retirement nest. But I was raised by Harry and Esther, and that's just not the way I am going to live. A precious gentleman came up at the end of service. He said, how old did you say you are, Brother Hoffman? I said, 64. He said, I'm 84. He said, we're breaking ground in May. <laughs> he said, old dogs can learn new tricks, Brother Hoffman. He said, let you and me be Caleb's. <clears throat> let's, let's just say, give me that mountain. My, my, don't get stuck where you are. We're going to pray and then these people are going to sing a great song. I want the whole church to be the choir when they sing. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I know, I know there's a man that you have called me to be that as of yet, I have never become. I'm not who I used to be and I'm a long way down the road from that kid that you started working on many years ago. But I know in my heart that I am not all that you called me to be. And so leading this prayer right now over these people, I'm convinced there's a whole bunch of others that feel the same way I do. Grateful for what you've done in our lives, but knowing knowing honestly in our heart of hearts that I can go higher, that I, I, I can grow to another level, that I do not want to be handicapped nor hijacked and I do not want my life burglarized by my circumstance and my past that just lynches and links and just holds me down to where I am. Your word says that there are lay aside every weight and sin which easily beset us. And there are some things that aren't necessarily sin, but they're, they're weights and they're holding us down and they're impeding our progress from becoming the man and the woman that you called us to be. So corporately around this altar, Lord, I'm praying on behalf of this church right now, preacher, people, shepherd, sheep, we are confessing to you right now that I want this to be the greatest year of personal growth that I've ever known. Whether, whether it's, it's prayer that needs to be strengthened, whether it's Bible that needs to be memorized, whether it's weight that needs to be laid aside, whatever in my physical or my spiritual walk, I want, I want to be the man and the woman that you called me to be. Hear my prayer right now. And some of these things have hit me hard, Lord, because like the mirror that your word is intended to be, I see myself. And there are areas and issues in my life that I need to evict and I need to extract from my spirit. 
I do not want to be an angry man. I do not want to be full of guilt. I do not want to be jealous. I do not want to be greedy. I'm asking you, Lord, right now, let this be a church. Brother Michael talked about it, and I've always prayed it. Oh, Jesus, we want the footprint of this church to be worldwide. We're going to build another building, but in all of that, we're not going to give less to missions while we're building the building, Lord. I'm believing that you will bless what we do because our heart is in the kingdom. I'm asking you, God, to guide us and direct us and order our steps like your word said that you would. I pray for every marriage that's in this house right now. We made a vow for better or for worse. Some might be better, some may be worse right now, but we made a vow for better or worse until death do we part. I want that same vow to be in this church towards you. But I, I, I understand that death will not separate me from you, but in fact, will join me to you in a way that I never could ever wrap my mind around. Holy God, anoint, guide, guard, direct this house and enable us, Lord, to be the hospital for the sick you intended us to be, to be a place of repair, a place of mending, a place where people's lives can be put back together again, where the bruised reed can be can be splinted and be used again. You're not going to stomp out the coal that's still smoldering in our spirit, but you're going to gently blow on it and coax it back to flame. So every marriage, every family, every relationship, every attitude, sift through our spirit, Lord, because we want our heart to be right, because we understand that the words of our mouth originate in the meditations of our heart. So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I want to ascend to the hill of the Lord, but I'm never going to do it without clean hands and a pure heart. I'm asking you, God, I'm asking you, forgive me. Forgive me for being greedy. Forgive me for being jealous. Forgive me for being angry. And I believe you have forgiven me and I accept your forgiveness to deal with my guilt. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all
So from my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's. I wonder if we can lift up our hands and sing this. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it is. situation that came in your mind when the pastor was speaking. I think it was 10 years ago, at least 10 years ago when pastor first went through the heart attack series here at First Church that I'm aware of. And I remember sitting uh, in here and there were two, two people that crossed my mind. The first one was a pastor that deeply hurt me and the other was a I would call her a worship pastor, but it's probably a worship director. She wasn't pastoring. It puts me in a grateful place for a worship pastor, Draylon Young, that genuinely loves this church. When I say a worship pastor, I've seen him pastor students, young adults, even some of the older ones in this room, has a heart for people. But I'll never forget the moment I had my first solo as a teenager. And I remember inviting family to be with us in service. And back then we had two services, the morning and the evening. And we came to practice Sunday evening. And I'll never forget when she said, hey, Mike, um, we actually going to give your part to somebody else. They're just better than you. And as a kid, I remember crying. I was humiliated in front of my family in front of my, just not my immediate family, but the guests that came to hear me. I was so proud of that moment. And I'll never forget when I went to that bathroom in the basement and just cried. And it was in that moment that I said, I'll never do this again. Years had gone by and I refused to sing out loud. I never would sing. And I'll never forget during the heart attack series when pastor began to speak about the hurt and the anger that I had. There were things that were blocked in my walk with God because 
I was able to do all these other things, but inside of my heart, I had such resentment that turned into bitterness from the anger that I now resented this person and I would never say. But in that message, those two people came up. One I had no longer had access to speak to. One I did. And I remember dealing with that pastor one on one. But I couldn't talk to her. I had no access to her anymore. So I remember making peace with God and forgiving her of the hurt she had caused and my response in the pain. That I began to sing again. And if you're here, and if, if you get up here, I sing loud. It's like my dad. You can hear my dad a mile away. I've got the same gift as my dad. I'm probably more in beat than he is. But we sing. I'm not the most gifted singer by any means. But because I took care of a heart issue I harbored since I was a teenager, I was able to sing again. And when I started singing again, there were things in life that happened over the last 10 years. If you've been on this journey with me, you know my journey. And because of being able to sing out loud one more time, my worship went to another level. And as soon as my worship went to the next level, I went through some of the darkest nights in my life. And the only reason I can stand in front of you victorious is because there was a song that was placed back into my spirit because I dealt with the hard issue that I had fought. For over 20 years, I held on to that. For 20 years, I wouldn't sing publicly because of something I harbored in my heart for years. So this is what I'm challenging to the church today. As you go home, I invite you to hear this again. As you go home and probably should have some conversations tonight, because I promise you, if I never dealt with that in my past, I can't tell you that I would have made it through some of these last seasons of my life over the last five or six years without a song in my spirit. And I would hate for you to be in this room and have a miracle blocked because of something that you haven't dealt with in your past that's in your heart still today. Hear me, I'm telling you. It will block places that you have prayed for for years because of things you refuse to deal with right now. And before you come to prayer tomorrow night, I challenge you, have those conversations. Inventory your heart, pray over it. Make the step because I promise you, if you come back in this house tomorrow night for prayer, what you have been praying and seeking for for so long, God will begin to open up doors for you that you thought you had no access or you didn't belong walking through because of something that was harbored in your heart. Jesus, you know exactly who is in this room and who is online listening. You know, as we were listening to your word go forth, there was some ground that received it, maybe some that was stony, some with thorns. But God, you know exactly what was spoken this morning. And I am asking, that the situations that came up in our minds this morning, the names, the faces that came up in our minds this morning, I am asking that we leave this place with courage and boldness to know that there are things you're waiting to trust us with. There are things waiting for us to have access to. But God, how can you trust us if we haven't taken care of the least of these? God, I don't deny, I, I don't walk away from this knowing that it's not painful. I understand what hurt feels like. I know what this sheer embarrassment looks like. I know, God, that sometimes we have masked and, and covered with layers of, of, of things we've placed around us to protect us from having to deal with that, God. But Lord, I am asking over your people this morning that there is a liberty that comes over them. There is an authority that comes in their life for them to know that they can't take back those moments. We can revisit those issues and make them right once again. Because God, whether it's in our court or theirs, it is up to us to leave our gift at the altar and to find them, to find the issue, deal with the issue. Because I believe the victory will come when there is no longer an aching in our lives, when there's nothing hidden under our tents, when we are truly pure before you. And so God, I am I'm asking you, that Lord, that you would bring these words back into our minds, that we would retain what we have heard, because I believe, Lord, this will be a year 
that some of us will walk into a new place in our relationship with you because we listen to a message that truly challenges us to the core, to who we really are behind closed doors. When the phones are off, the internet's off, and it's just us and you, and you can still see what we're dealing with. God, let this be a place where we build those altars, a place where a memorial will be built this weekend that we are going to finally put it to rest. We're finally canceling the debts. We're finally forgiving them. We're finally walking away from it truly and beginning the rebuild process with your help and your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Can we all say amen together and clap in agreement that we are going to inventory and deal with it and come to prayer with an authority and a covering over our lives, knowing that this is a pivotal moment in our lives where we can look back and see where the miracle began. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. I love and appreciate everyone that's in this house. Have a great week. Do not forget to sign up for Life Groups if you have not done so yet. And for those who can, we will see you tomorrow night in prayer. God bless you.